George Friedman, founder and chairman of Geopolitical Futures. We hope he's with us. There he is. Hi, George Friedman. Thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. You know, we know this pandemic could prove a deeply destabilizing factor, not just economically, but also geopolitically. Where do you see areas of concern, you know, for areas where there may be serious change on the horizon? Well, we've been undergoing change ever since 2008. What the coronavirus has done is accelerated and intensified some of the processes that are already in place. So China was already staggering economically and particularly hit by the U.S. sanctions. Now its largest customer, the United States, is in deep recession, not able to buy its goods and not trusting China. Uh, Russia uh, was already in an oil crisis. Now the price of oil has evaporated. Its ability to function limited. Europe has been fragmenting. Uh, Brexit has taken place. Tensions within the European Union are there. Now they've come to an in increasing point where, for example, the Italians and the Germans completely disagree on uh, what needs to be done. So I don't think this coronavirus has changed the trajectory of the world. It has speeded it up. We're seeing crises all over the world that were endemic but now uh, intensified. Okay, but it, I mean, it sounds like the most powerful countries in the world are facing obviously serious challenges, but it doesn't really change their ranking, so to speak, because people are talking about this whole new world order, but it sounds like the order might still remain the same, albeit with weakened economies and power. Well, I don't see how China sustains its economic position in the world. It's not simply a question of uh, challenging the United States. I mean, it was badly hit by 2008. It's an export-oriented economy. Exports dried up. Now exports are paralyzed. So the question is, how much, how far down does China go? How far down does Russia go when oil, its primary commodity for export, goes away? But I mean, so, won't, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just have to ask. I mean, won't the oil price bounce back though once you know the economy starts, industry starts moving again? Well, if you think that, then I hope you buy oil. But it's <laughs> no one knows if it'll bounce we back. We all do. If not directly, we are all consumers of that oil via our yeah, industries. Russia needs seventy dollar a barrel oil to balance its economy. It can get by with forty. It's the amount that oil has to improve is three, four fold to make a difference. This is a secular shift in the nature of the oil markets driven in part by the development of American United States as an oil exporter, but also driven in part by the efficiencies that have developed in the economy. So this is not a passing thing that's simply the coronavirus. It is something intensified. But I think the world order is changing, that a lot of countries that appear to be emerging and challenging for the top position have now been badly weakened. And that has changed. I, I, I need to address something else with you. I mean, when we look at history, and I said really our only reference point for this, it's economically, it's getting to be the Great Depression. We are seeing that level of poverty now, joblessness. And what re reignited the economy in the wake of the Great Depression was, of course, war. Uh, you have certain leaders now, very powerful leaders, uh, not least, you know, in the United States, who might be looking for scapegoats or to divert attention. Uh, should we be concerned on that front? Might we see powerful people get reckless? Well, powerful people didn't get powerful because they were reckless. We like to think of them as that. And every leader is trying to find someone other than himself responsible for this, and no one is. But we have to distinguish between what a recession and a depression is. A recession is a cyclical event, primarily financial. A depression is when the economy itself is destroyed. The businesses are gone permanently. Uh, jobs have disappeared. Uh, food is not available. This is not yet a depression. And in benchmarking it, we should draw that distinction. It may become one if this isn't solved soon, but I'd look very hopefully at some of the medical developments that have been made in the United States, Europe, and China, that they, we may find a mitigation to this before we go into recession. So I think we, depression. I think we have to be very careful not to overstate what's going on. It's a terrible thing. But if you look at the Great Depression, it was horrible. This is not yet that. 
Okay, but I mean, your, your hope is that medically the situation will be solved in time for it to become a Great Depression. So we really do have to pray that a vaccine uh, does become available or else this could sink us into the same position we were in in the 1930s. Um, it, it doesn't have to be a vaccine. It can simply be something more like that will make Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, though, about, you know, something we're seeing, and we were just talking about South Africa there. You know, we're seeing up to four kilometer lines of people just waiting for food because they can no longer feed themselves or their families. Food security was becoming an issue, uh, particularly in the developing world, even before uh, this pandemic. Do you think we are prepared as a global society for those kinds of shortages? You know, even in the United States, when we're looking at the president insisting that meatpacking industries stay online, even while there's a huge risk for their employees, they need to ensure that food is delivered and deliverable to people and still affordable. Is that being managed to make sure that a true crisis in food doesn't, doesn't break out? Well, I'm very cynical about this idea of a global community responsible. <laughs> Each leader is responsible for his own country. Uh, South Africa has gone through a very difficult time leading up to this and therefore suffers greatly. But South Africa, I think, also has an opportunity here, having faced the abyss, to pull itself together politically, socially, and economically and say, it can't be like this. But the problem with much of the developing world is it's waiting for somebody from the outside to come and solve its problems. And by now, this far after decolonization, we have to face the fact they're not coming. Okay. Uh, I do have time for one last question. So I just want to get your final outlook for the United States. Uh, you seem, as I said before, that you, know, you, you think a medical solution to this will come sooner rather than later. Are you optimistic then about the U.S. economy not just pulling itself up, but if it does, therefore pulling up the rest of the global economy because it is the number one top consumer on the planet? The United States is going to, to go to two, three very difficult years. Uh, but firstly, it is consuming its own products, and that drives its economy. And unfortunately for the world, the way it will solve the problem is by decreasing imports. And that's a problem for other countries uh, that export to the United States. But the United States, make no mistake about it, is going to go through a economic crisis of significant proportions, if not a depression, but also a political one. We have a, an election coming. And in this election, there is deep social division in the United States of what should happen. And this will become a very tense period in American history. George Friedman, great to have George you. Friedman. Thanks so much for joining us.